I guess I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's God that made me this way. It's, it's just when everybody says it's, this is the way it is, I always ask the question, I want to know why. And who, who started the belief system? Like, who, who made it this way? And uh, because you just watch masses of people and they follow everything. I was driving one time across um, from Ontario in Canada all the way to Idaho and I had lots to think about that week. I'm in the car by myself and the process was going through my head, this thought. I thought the Pharisees, nobody ever talks about these guys. They, they only bring them out, you know, for skits in the church. You know, they dress them up in robes and stuff and they're almost like comical characters or something. I think they just come from Bible days and whatnot, as if they're not here anymore. And I'm pretty certain I've met a couple of them. As you go along, and uh, when I got to Idaho, interestingly enough, I had one song I got to preach that Sunday morning, uh, and I had a concert that night. And the preacher had a sermon about how do you when we're scorned, how do we react to that? And the picture, and he had sermon notes, so he handed out this to everybody, so they all get a, this sermon note thing. And on the picture on the front was Jesus with three angry Pharisees staring at him. But through the whole hour sermon, they never even talk about the Pharisees. And uh, it's all about being scorned by the world. It's always, you know, when you stand for, you know, against abortion and thing. And there's truth to that. There's scorn involved, but you'd think there was no religious. These guys never talk about the Pharisees, and there's a picture in the front of the sermon. And I thought, why don't they talk about them, unless maybe they are them. <laughs> and and you just, I, I've had some hard, I know, I know it sounds kind of funny. You guys are easy to sing to. It's not, people, other people don't laugh. They, they, <laughs> they. But this song here, um, I've only sang this once, so hopefully it's okay with you guys. But I get emails sometimes, and I mean, there is, it's, it's not always funny. People write you notes, and they, they try to stop you from bringing the good news. That Jesus came to, to bring life to people. If they come as a child, and there's religious stuff that's out there that does not want you to do that. And they play hard games with you. And so this, I was in one guy's office one day, a really nice pastor, and talking, and, and he said, um, an old guy came into his office one day, and he says, well, you know what people like that are? He says, they're Bible smart and Jesus dumb. <laughs> I've never, I never heard it put that way. But, you know, in, in my moment of pain, I needed a little outlet of, it's almost like, I know what I believe. I know the God I serve. Why do they keep trying to take this from me? And why do they want me to stop us from telling others? And so anyway, this song, I hope you guys are okay with it. You see them coming out of church And their face looks like it hurts They're always preaching up a storm Singing every Sunday morn But it's mainly all rehearsed Saying God's the one they know But it doesn't really show not sure where they're coming from, but I think they fit the pun. They're Bible smart and Jesus dumb. They've got a fancy PhD. Hmm. They're so proud of their degree. They know the scriptures inside out. Think they've really got some clout, but they don't know ABC. That simple faith just trips them up. They're stuck in some religious rut They're not good at one plus one It makes their theories come undone They're Bible smart and Jesus dumb Bible smart and Jesus dumb They're as kooky as they come 
Reading all about the Lord With faces straighter than a board Walking round and looking glum Think they're so ever loving smart But the Lord ain't in their heart They're so proud of what they've done But the total and the sum Is Bible smart and Jesus dumb They've got a church where people smile that's the newest thing in style And their leader is so smug But I'm afraid the great big lug Ain't been with God in quite a while Cause what he's preaching makes no sense It's just like straddling the fence They want the world to be their chum That's the only tune they hum They're Bible smart and Jesus dumb they say they're preaching about prosperity You need to claim it, that's the key On what your little heart is set That's the thing you're gonna get But their books are never free Can't see there's just one little glitch Jesus Christ was never rich I guess they'll beat their silly drum from now to kingdom come, they're Bible smart and Jesus dumb. Bible smart and Jesus dumb. They're as kooky as they come. Reading all about the Lord, looking for a big reward, like the lottery been won. Think they're so ever loving smart, but the Lord ain't in their heart. They're so proud of what they've done, but the total and the sum is Bible smart and Jesus dumb. They like to tell you what is what, but their heart's completely shut. Can't see the forest for the trees, I'm thinking hell would have to freeze before they'd get up off their butt. Been sitting way too long in class. Eating some professor's trash When I hear that stuff I run It's just another web they've spun They're Bible smart and Jesus dumb Bible smart and Jesus dumb They're as kooky as they come Reading all about the Lord With faces straighter than a board Walking round and looking glum Bible smart and Jesus dumb They're as kooky as they come Reading all about the Lord Looking for a big reward Like the lottery'd been won Think they're so ever loving smart But the Lord ain't in their heart they're so proud of what they've done, but the total and the sum is Bible smart and Jesus dumb. They're so proud of what they've done, but the total and the sum is Bible smart and Jesus dumb. Actually, I know I'm a little twisted in some ways, but <laughs> but I've got a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of serious moments that I have in my life, and there's nobody there to laugh with me or cry with me or anything. And I've seen some things that I, I couldn't figure out, and uh, what Robert is going to talk about has been something that. I, I'd never really been around people much that ever addressed the subject. And uh, and I've had some of the worst treatment from people like this, and it's a Calvinistic thing. And I tried to figure them out. And there's been a resurgence of this in the last 15 years or whatever it is. And I watched people that with tender hearts, and I watched them be converted to this. And I was asked to sing in a conference with 
in Atlanta, and there's a thousand people there about four years ago, and they don't they didn't like what I sang about at all. Even when I sing the most tender hearted song about my life, you look out and and it's almost like there's nobody home. And there was about 50, maybe I didn't count exactly, that came to me after through the crowd. They were different. You could see it in their eyes. But the rest, they, they almost worshipped these, these heavy-handed speakers. And one of them was a guy named Paul Washer. And I watched these young people. It's like an army that's being formed. And they, they look for somebody that has, that can really get up there and preach. But this, God's not in it. I know he's not. I've been down that road. And I remember on a tenting trip one time I was out and going over this in my mind and it was almost like a wrestle with a demon in my tent. I don't know what it was. But I got out and looked up at the stars and I started singing How Great Thou Art. And you could feel the presence of God. It's like he, he had to show me that the difference between the two. And this song here is uh, it's a song God gave me in the middle of the night. So you've been picked by God before all time began. Doesn't care about the soul of every man. You'll get this message out to everyone you can with bits and pieces of the Bible in your hand. The arrogance that I hear in your voice proclaims that heaven is nobody's choice, that God controls the human race like little toys. But there's no logic in your words, it's only noise You may think the average Joe ain't got the smarts But we won't question all your ludicrous remarks But you're forgetting that God speaks to tender hearts And that's kinda how salvation really starts And then you tell me nothing happened on that night when I cried to God and I received my sight Well, I'm sorry, sir, but you don't have the right To be shading everything that's black and white Now, Mr. Washer and all those like yourself should be locked away on some forgotten shelf There are souls outside the gate and it's almost twelve And that stuff you're trying to peddle sure don't help That smug look of yours sure gives you guys away Makes it hard to take in anything you say That smooth tongue of yours might say you know the way but to me, you're only actors in a play. You speak a little truth and draw your listeners in. That's how your crafty, made-up stories all begin. But this power-tripping game you'll never win. Cause some can add and we don't buy the web you spin. How can you tell us nothing happened on that night? When we cried to God and we received our sight Well, I'm sorry, sir, but you don't have the right You've pushed it far enough, now you've got to fight You've bullied your way into homes and lives and your fur and teeth are cleverly disguised Well, here's one verse I think you should try on for size God hides the truth from those who think they're wise Jesus said to come to Him just like a child And I know you find that concept pretty wild 
It pulls the plug on your theology and style And heaven knows that we're allowed to have a smile I don't do this kind of singing just for spite It's cause you've taken heaven's door and slammed it tight And millions like me who bowed their hearts one night Would like to tell you, sir, that you don't have the right Thank you, Trevor. Trevor and, and Robert have never met before, but it, Robert just said, boy, did he set me up for my study tonight. <laughs> I said, you're going to hear a guy that, you've, that uh, is, one, is one of a kind, and he re really didn't know what it, I was talking about, but, but now that he's done four songs, he gets it. <laughs> so what a joy it is to have you here, Trevor, and you really did set up his message. So, how many of you uh, are familiar with Robert Cogden? Mm, rough, roughly half. Um, he's one of the few men today that is um, uh, dealing with the issue of uh, Calvinism. And um, he can write on it in uh, a deep theological method, but he can also write to the millennials. Um, Dave Hunt had a book this sick. Great book. But you could didn't have to read the whole book. All you had to read is the title. It says, What Kind of Love Is This? And it explains the whole book. And um, I'm not going to take his, his time. He, first time he came, he came as if he was, had a suit on, he had a tie on. And um, we had a little talk with him. And, uh, and uh, the next day he had a, a Hawaiian shirt on, so <laughs> he was he was welcomed into the family, but he didn't know he's short sleeve. He's not wearing a Hawaiian shirt today, but it's uh, he left. How warm was it when he left? Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina. yeah, but what? It, yeah, it was 83. <laughs> so we knocked off 50 degrees just to make him feel at home here. <laughs> anyway, let's make him feel welcome, then. Robert Cogman. Well, they said I have to adjust this, so we better do that right now. There we go. It is good to be with you. Um, yeah, I uh, have tried to adjust here. You see that. And, um, and I, I've never forgotten the experience the first time I was here, and in a very positive way. And um, through the years, I've just gotten stronger in my feelings and uh, how super pastor's doing here in this, this church is, and, uh, and he can tell you too, some of my views about Calvary Chapel are growing and growing. Uh, I've been to one in Germany, one in Britain, and the Lord's really doing the work to those who are staying true to the scriptures, and that's what you're going to find out with me. Um, I, I really am upset in today's world. I can't sing, by the way. You'll never hear me sing. But um, what I see is happening in churches around the world today has really caused me to be disturbed. And that's what really prompted to some of the ways we've kind of directed our ministry. And I don't give big commercials. I, in fact, I never pay for advertising or anything anywhere. But um, word of mouth, because we're finding that people are getting desperate. And I'm talking about Christians are getting desperate to know the Word of God and to understand it now because they can't find it. In Britain, where I've served many years, people don't have a church to go to anymore, period. And in the United States, I've done rough surveys in conferences I've been in. Sometimes up to about a third of the people at the conference have no church they can attend where there's Bible teaching and they can worship. That's where it's going. 
In Britain, one of the reasons I created a TV station that I control everything on um, is because what they do is two or three couples in a town get together and they sing together, they pray together, they read the scriptures together, and then they turn on the internet to hear some Bible teaching because there is none within driving distance. And I'm talking two hours or more driving distance where they live. Or they've been asked to get out of the church they're in because they hold to Bible principles. So all of that has prompted to where we're headed tonight and where we're headed tomorrow. And one of my goals is to reach the 20 to 40-year-olds. That's everybody I see here, I think, is in that group, all right? Um, the, the, what they do, and I like to think I still am one, okay? <laughs> And it's getting awkward because I have kids that are in that age group now. But anyway, um, they go to the Internet for their teaching. So that's what we've done. We're doing the same thing. We're now available on every medium that they go to. Roku TV, iTunes, Apple TV, etc. So that's kind of a little background. If you're interested in more about that, please see me, because I really need more people to know about it and tell others about it. And um, that's where we're going. Okay, so now, I'm just going to point out, because of what happened in Britain, due to a theology that took over that country, it has destroyed the spirituality, the spiritual life, of the churches in Britain. The average church is 20 people, and I'm talking about good churches. Now, there are three Calvary churches that are in Britain today that are growing, and they've got more than 20 because God's blessing and they're teaching God's word. But overall, 42 million people don't have churches anymore. So we're trying to reach them, and I'm going to be teaching you subjects that a lot of people say, oh, I don't think I want to study that. Or that's too hard, my brain can't handle. Yes, it can, because God made it so we can understand it. It's men that have changed it and made it hard to understand. So having said all that, first of all, we've got to have a good millennial introduction. Let's hope it works. It didn't. Oh. Hang on, guys, sound guys. Let's go back, try once more. It worked a while ago. It's not going to work. Work tomorrow. Okay. Very frustrating. It, it goes all this stuff about the tumbling tulip of Calvinism. And the tulip tumbles. Okay, now for each of us here, understanding the complexities of the various systems of theology seem to be almost beyond what we can handle. Therefore, I thought an appropriate analogy would make it helpful to understand in a way we can understand all of this. You see, many years ago when I was a preteen, I needed a new suit, because we wore suits in those days, uh, for church. My father took me to the local clothing store to buy a suit. When the salesman asked me, what size are you? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. So he so showed me several suit sizes, varying sizes. They said, these are going to fit you. After a great deal of time and nothing fit, the salesman impatiently declared to me, you're not average. We're going to try to fix oh, hold it. We don't we're, have we're going to try to fix it. Fix what? what? Oh, Thomas. We can't make work. <laughs> I can't figure out what. Are you not getting the signal up there? No. Whoops. Because oh. we had it. Now let's get the keynote. There you go. Okay. Oh, I've got to have my pictures. I have uh, one church that when I speak to, all these kids come because they just like my pictures. 
All right. We're up. All right. Now let's see. If the... Ah. Thank you. Okay, I started talking about complexities. Now we're down to when I'm a preteen at the store. What size am I? I didn't know. The, the salesman looked at me. He wasn't a good salesman, believe me. And he said, you're not average. You need a tailor. Oh, I was shocked. Because you know what? I thought I was a typical 12-year-old. But now I figured there's something wrong with me. I'm not average and I have to have a tailor. Well, my dad took me aside and he said, no, Rob, you need to understand this. You just don't fit into the industry's standard sizes that are designed to accommodate a variety of body types within a limited number of sizes and that would require very minimal alterations. I just needed to find a store that was ready to alter the suit to fit me. We're in a world where it's time that we find the suit that fits us based on the scriptures and not what men say and men's philosophies and opinions. So we're going to look at the scriptures. Now, my illustration is simple, and you need to understand this in the past. When I was a young person, not quite so young anymore, my suit size was Calvinism. And my sleeve size, if you will, was the type of church you were in. I was in a Presbyterian church. At that time, I thought, this is what it's all about. You see, a system of theology helps to establish a foundation, a foundational approach that will affect every Christian's lives. Whether you realize it or not, every time you read the Bible, you listen to a biblical message, a system of theology is influencing your understanding of what you are reading or hearing. The suit each one of us wears has gradually been acquired over a period of time through messages, through teaching, your reading, what you hear on the radio, personal studies, lyrics of hymns and songs and choruses that we sing. That's why, by the way, if you want to hear about music, I love to talk about it. Because I'm concerned that even, quote, the great hymns of the past, many of them are doctrinally wrong. And yet we just sing them happily because we like the tunes. We need to examine these things carefully in light of the scriptures. I found that when I went to Britain, I stepped into the world of Reformed theology. You say, oh, I don't know what that is. It's Calvinism another term for it. It's basically what's about 80% of the Christians in our world believe. You say, oh, am I a Calvinist? Well, I hope not. We'll see by the time we're done. All right. I decided to pick the most foundational aspect of Calvinism and study it together tonight. You see, Calvinism consists of what's called the tulip. Now, I'm working on the assumption that none of you know anything. I'm sure you know a lot about Calvinism, but I'm going to kind of approach it, take it simple and easy, in case there's some that might be confused. Calvin came up with five key doctrines, and they started with the letters T-U-L-I-P, and it became the term TULIP. And when you see TULIP, that means Calvinism. These letters represent total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. Now, you probably, in seeing that, already have in your mind what those things mean. And if you're a pastor here, or a Bible teacher, you probably are sure you know what they mean. So we're going to double check to see if you do. Because when I sat down and studied it for the first time, I said, whoa, 
that is not what I believe, and that is not what I read in the scriptures, and yet that's called Calvinism when we're all supposed to like it. So I'm going to try and take you through that now on the first one, the tumbling tea of Tulip. The spokesman for New Calvinism today is John Piper. He's the elder statesman. Notice what he says here. The doctrines of grace, they're told depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, are the warp and the woof of the biblical gospel that so many saints have cherished for centuries. You see, if Calvinism is right and Piper is right, then his five points define the gospel that you're supposed to share. Now, think about this. If what you're sharing isn't the gospel, that's dangerous. Now, the theme of this conference is Galatians. So, of course, we've got to go to Galatians at least once. Okay, with me. Okay. So go to Galatians chapter 1. Actually, I go to Galatians a whole lot with people that I talk to one-to-one -one because this is where a lot are falling into things the wrong way. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Notice what Paul says. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, notice what it says. Let him be accursed. Woo! That is strong terminology. If you don't have the gospel right, he's saying, and you're presenting the wrong gospel, you should be accursed. Now understand, he's speaking to believers in this letter. So I'm going to say right up front, not all Calvinists are unsaved. Okay? I, I was a Calvinist. I got saved. The bottom line is we have to be sure the gospel we're preaching is the true biblical gospel today. And with that kind of warning, if we detect that some other system is false, we've got to get away from it as fast as we can. Okay? So here we're going to go now into the tumbling of TULIP. T stands for total human depravity. The Calvinistic system entirely is built upon this doctrine. If you show that the total human depravity they preach is wrong and not biblical, everything will collapse after it. Tomorrow I'll show you how the second one will collapse after the first one goes. But this is the foundational one. Thus, if this is taught wrong by them, they're wrong completely. The key verse that Calvinists use is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We'll turn there in a little bit, but I'll just read it right now for you. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, and then skipping to verse 3, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, this is describing a hopeless condition. The individual in the state who hasn't been quickened or made alive spiritually is doomed for a place called hell if he doesn't change his path. If he doesn't come to understand what true salvation is, he will spend, as we have heard and reinforced, eternity there, paying for his sins that he has done in his life. He will be separated for eternity from God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's the consequences of sin. The only hope for salvation to any human being is that God is going to provide it, the salvation. You see, I can sing up here all night. Well, I couldn't because you'd throw me out. <laughs> I could do good works all day. I can get baptized. I can attend church. I can do everything they tell me to do, and I still could go to hell because I can't earn my way to heaven, period. 
You see, God's grace and God has to be the one to have taken care of my sins. Starting out with that idea, put simply here, you and I, when we are born and as we're growing, are spiritually dead and we are unable to reconcile ourselves to God, the natural result is that we are in a depraved state. That's clear. That's biblical. Okay? Now, a lot of people say, oh, God will overlook it. Baloney. A just and holy God could not provide salvation to all men by just saying, I'll overlook the sin. Or I'll just erase them and don't worry about them. It's no big deal. Or I'll write them off. God doesn't do that because he's holy and just. And he can't violate his own nature. You see, the magnitude of our sin is an affront to his absolute holiness. Interestingly, up to this point, Calvinists and I agree. It's now that we start splitting. We both also agree that God is the one that enables spiritually dead individuals to come alive. For Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 1, and here's a literal translation of the verse, and I think it actually makes it clear. And you being dead, with reference to your trespasses and sins, he, God, made alive. Well, that's interesting, because that's starting to sound like election and all those horrible Calvinistic thinkings. No, it doesn't. Just look at the verse carefully here. Don't put more into a verse than it says. Don't add to the scriptures. Take them as you read them. Notice this verse does not say how God does it or how he can make you alive. Calvinists say, yes, it does. And you'll see in a moment how they argue that. And I'll say, no, it doesn't say how. It says that you are started out dead spiritually and God, through some means, which he doesn't define here, makes you alive. And so you need to understand how that is done, what it is. And it's done by a new spiritual birth. Now, biblically, the fancy name for that is regeneration. It means born again, okay? And what we need to understand is that when we're in a depraved state before we are saved, we have the potential, did you hear what I said, potential? To commit all types of evil throughout his or her lifetime. We can do all these things that are evil, but let's face it, not everybody does as many evil, horrible things as someone else. Everybody in this room, if I asked you, would point at somebody in history or somewhere and say, they're worse than I am, right? So, yes, we see good things being done in the world, but basically all mankind is depraved until God works a miracle in them. And now I'm getting ahead of myself in by you receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. Just in case you're starting to think, oh, this is getting too Calvinistic here. Okay, noted Calvinistic theologian Henry Thyssen said, this doesn't mean total human depravity, that every sinner is devoid or empty of all qualities pleasing to men, that he commits or is prone to every form of sin, or that he's a bitterly opposed to God as possible to be. No, but he has the potential to be totally depraved, evil, and, a, and commit sins. We've got to never forget that when Adam's fall brought not only spiritual death to humanity, but you know it brought physical death into the world also? The Bible clearly says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all what? Die. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto man once to die. Now, I believe the scriptures are true. And I thought all Calvinists would agree with me on these verses. And I was surprised to find there's a significant difference in our definitions. 
And so we're going to have to look first at the Calvinist definition of human depravity. And, you know, it, it, it's famous. It's called the Westminster Confession. And, you know, it described it the way I used to describe total human depravity, only theirs are flowerier terms than I do. But we have to see what they're saying before we can see why the Bible so teaches the opposite. So we read, Human depravity, man by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability, now notice the next couple words, of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man being altogether adverse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or, and here's the catch, to prepare himself thereunto. Very simply, putting it in simple terms, there's nothing you can do to have faith. It's beyond you. You're just totally depraved. Therefore, there must be another solution, they would say. Well, first of all, when I was a teen, I just said, okay, it means that somehow God's grace is going to provide what I can't do. And that'll be great. And I'll accept it. Now, I knew that God sent his son to accomplish mankind's redemption through Jesus Christ's substitutionary death, his burial, and his resurrection. And by doing that, Jesus Christ enabled God to offer salvation to all men. Did you hear what I said? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross, salvation is potentially available to all men and women. Nowadays, you've got to say it carefully. Um, you've got to put up with this old guy. He still says all men, meaning everybody. All right. So then I look very carefully, and I see in the scripture... John 1.12, as many as received him. Now, there's a well-known evangelist that challenged me. He says, you find a verse in the Bible that says you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is the verse I used. Now, I want you to read the, hear the definition of what the word receive means. It means to accept, to appropriate, to take for one's own as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The individual said, no, no, it doesn't say accept. Okay. But John says that, to take it into your own. Now, after many years of study, I was taken to a back when I came to understand what the Calvinism, Calvinism really teaches. That we are unable to believe the gospel. Therefore, faith is not possible. Now, this is just a little side. You can put it on wherever you want. Calvinists use the word believe differently than you use the word faith. Keep that in mind whenever you read something by them. We'll see clear what faith is versus believe. Calvinists, I do agree that salvation of individuals is not accomplished through human efforts or works. Ephesians 2 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, now we're at a crossroad. Calvinists say there is no ability to exercise faith. And I, in case you wonder what I am, I'm a biblicist someone who takes the scriptures as I read it. I say we have an ability to exercise faith. These are 180 degrees apart. And before we're done, if you don't see it's 180 degrees apart, we really need to talk because I'm trying to make this as simple as I can as we get into that part of it, all right? You see, the whole difference... The deciding factor is all based on Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. The Calvinists add the word total human depravity to their definition because they say that sin infects every part of you that there is. It affects just your mind, your body, your will to accept anything, your emotions. In other words, a Calvinist basically takes you takes away you being a human being in my opinion 
John Piper defines spiritual death, get this now carefully, is the state of being incapable of any life with God before salvation. Our hearts were like a stone toward God. And he gives us his support, Ephesians, and a verse in Ezekiel 38, 26. Very interesting. I take the scriptures the way I read it. Ezekiel 36 talks about Israel, a nation, a whole nation's group, not individuals, saying that they're rejecting God. You see, the whole bottom line with a Calvinist is that a human being is a stone, totally inanimate, totally incapable of seeing, hearing, doing anything. It's just a blob. You pick graphite, whatever stone you want to make it, all right? Yes, they say his heart is deceitful and desperately corrupt, but they say his will is not free. It's in bondage to this evil nature. Therefore, he will not, he cannot choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. For the Calvinist, Total human depravity defines spiritual death as total inability to respond to any external spiritual stimulus. Now let me tell you what those stimuluses could be. God's word. You see here, God's word can't do anything for you because you're stone. Therefore, you've had it. Therefore, before you can respond... Before you can react, God has to change you from a stone to something that could react. And that is called regeneration coming before faith. Only regeneration can break the dead stone or the corpse and give life. Now a writer, a Calvinist writer, A.W. Pink said, Faith is not the cause of the new birth. New birth is what you and I call being saved. It's a consequence of it. So in other words, once God does something to you, then you are free to decide if you have faith. You may have heard of John MacArthur. He says that regeneration logically must initiate Faith. In other words, this action of God has to happen inside of you to change that stone before you can ever have faith. Let me get caught up here. I get worked up when I hear this because, you know. Okay. So now we're getting to the key to resolving. Are you a stone before you receive Christ? Or are you a human being that, yes, is depraved, has depravity, but do you have a will? The whole key, and this is where I take a little different approach instead of arguing it philosophically. By the way, if you're going to discuss this with a Calvinist, don't get into philosophy. They know Plato better than you do. And that's where a big part of the philosophy came from in Neoplatonism. No, 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 no. Get to what it boils down to. Let's figure out what the word death means. If we can define death, we can decide whether we're stones or not. There are two aspects of biblical death. Just so you know, I went through and I studied every use of the word death in the Bible before I came up with what I'm showing you here. Two aspects of death. First, the Bible always, when it speaks about death, speaks of two things, a physical death and a spiritual death. These are two Types of death, if you want to say. The second, uh, first of all, when man sinned in the garden, death began in the world, if you think about it. Because God said if they took of the fruit, they would die. But did Adam and Eve go, mm -hmm, fall over? No, they didn't. They became spiritually dead at that moment. And you know what else happened? Eve looked in the mirror and said, I think I got a wrinkle. <laughs> no, Adam did. No, the body started a process that would lead to death. 
You see, when they took of that fruit, they became separated spiritually from God. And their bodies also started going downhill. And you know what else? The earth did too. Now, there's a second aspect. A total human person consists of two parts. A physical or material part and a spiritual or immaterial part. If you are a real human in this room, you know all the talk of robots, you're never sure. If you're a real human being, there's two parts to you. Now, we're not going to get into a deep theological discussion tonight whether you're three parts or whether you're two parts, okay? Let's just keep it simple tonight. You have a physical part of you. My physical part can't see very well anymore, can't get up at 4.30 in the morning and then speak with total vibrance right now. <laughs> that's, that's this physical part of me. But there's also an immaterial part of me. I jokingly say that's the part sitting in here, but it's, it's the me, and I, you know you've got a me in you, of you, all right? There's two parts of you. Your body is a part of you. It is crucial to understand these two parts. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's speaking of material and immaterial parts. James 2 verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead. You see, your body has a material and an immaterial part. Those two parts put together makes you. And I'll just tell you, I'm not teaching it tonight when I teach about resurrection. But when you die, your physical is separated from your immaterial part. But resurrection is know what it is? It's the gluing you back together again, but with a body that's going to last forever. You see, in eternity, you're going to have a body along with your immaterial part. That body's going to be you. I'll walk up to you and say, I know you. And you'll say, yeah, I think I know you from... No. That's what resurrection is. It's putting them back together. If you grasp the whole meaning of death, it solves it all. When a person dies, you're split. A material part and an immaterial part. The material part goes into the grave. And according to the Bible, it always speaks of believers that body is asleep. I don't want to offend, but yeah, we've had songs that might offend somebody. Yeah, it didn't offend me, by the way. I'm totally behind that. The reason Christians were buried in the ground was because the body was described as sleep, awaiting to be awakened and resurrected and rise again. Can a cremated body be put back together again? Yeah, God can do that. But the picture we're showing of that body in the grave is the Material part is waiting to be resurrected and brought back to life and joined with the immaterial part again for eternity. The best part is that new body is glorified, will go forever. So what you have is the Bible defines physical death as a separation, a dissolution of the told person into two parts or components. It is not just the end of the body. When a person dies, sadly in our world today, people are saying, well, that's it. The best we can do is remember them. Baloney! I like that word. I like baloney, too. But, okay? Oh! As we'll see in just a second, that immaterial part continues to exist. And the material part waits to be put back. Even the unsaved are going to be resurrected and in eternity have a body with their material part, except they will be in hell. So once we understand that physical death is this dividing material part from immaterial part, and understanding that you only consist when you're fully together, you say, well, does that mean somebody in heaven today is really struggling because they don't have their body? Hey, the Lord's going to take care of that. I'm not worried about that. Okay? 
but they know they're going to get a body because the scriptures promise it, 1 Corinthians 15. And by the way, Jesus Christ is preparing a place for you today. Do you know the Bible makes it clear that that place is a physical place in heaven? Because you're going to have a body in heaven as the bride of Christ. So of course he's fixing a house for you to live in. Got to grasp that. Okay. Um, the Bible never, should I say this again, never describes death as a state of being unresponsive, inanimate, and stone-like, period. Ever. Now, the Bible does show that when one physically dies, their physical body is separated from the spirit. Spiritual death now. The individual spirit is separated from his creator God. You see the consistency of that? Physical death, you have a splitting of the material from the immaterial. Spiritual death is a separation from God. That's what Adam and Eve experienced when they first sinned. That's what you and I are born in that state, separated from God. Therefore, Romans 6.23 says the consequence or wages of sin is death. It's a separation from your creator. In the Garden of Eden, God created Adam and Eve with bodies that were capable of living and having fellowship with him forever, provided they didn't eat the forbidden fruit. Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God was warning Adam of both physical and spiritual death in this verse. They're the consequence of sin. Their spiritual death was immediate. And they became need of reconciliation with God. I'll have a video coming up in the next month about what is this idea of reconciliation with God. In the technical Calvinistic terms, it's called atonement. So if you'd really like to see how that's defined, uh, watch the video. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see these verses since every Calvinist that I deal with takes me to the same passage. Okay. We're going to look first at verse 1 again. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Dead, got the word? There's the word we've been looking at. The Bible's defined as separated. Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our life, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, the mind, and were by nature, in other words, when you were born, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were, what, dead in sins, not a stone, but dead, separated from God, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. By grace are ye saved. Now look at verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ. It doesn't say you're stone. It says you're without Christ. You're separated from God. That's what spiritual death is. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having what? No hope. And without God in the world. You see that? It's clearly, that's your state. You're separated from God. You have no hope. You are totally separated from him. You're not a stone. You're merely separated from, I shouldn't say merely because it's pretty serious. <laughs> Very eternally serious. Then Isaiah says it pretty clear. Your iniquities, sins, have what? Separated between you and your God. They're spiritual death. Separated. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. No single human being can ever save himself from the penalty of our own sins. Nor can he make it right or reconcile to God by himself. Everybody is in a state of total inability. 
Only Jesus Christ can offer reconciliation through his death on the cross. Hebrews 2.17 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Why? That, in order that, he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to what? Make reconciliation for the sins of the people. You see, we have two views of dead in trespasses and sin. Biblically dead means separation. Calvinistically means a stone. Everybody's got to decide which is right because it's going to have an effect on you eternally. It's going to have an effect on your family eternally, on your children eternally, and if you're old enough, on your grandchildren eternally. Do you know in Britain, people don't want to talk to their grandchildren about Jesus Christ because their children, the parents of these grandchildren, won't let them see their grandchildren anymore because that's how bad it's gotten in Britain. And I said, you better take the risk of not having opportunities with your grandchildren later by first sharing the gospel with them because you may not have them for eternity. Because they're going to be either elect or they aren't. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. If you accept Calvinism's stone or corpse analogy for spiritual death, you eliminate any possibility that mankind has been graciously granted a free will by an all-wise, all-sovereign creator. If the individual does not possess a free will, then of course he's incapable of responding by faith to the offer of salvation. Sadly, the Calvinistic stone analogy makes human beings mere robots that are awaiting one of two possible destina destinies that have been arbitrarily predetermined by an all-controlling God. Either some get regeneration and eternal life, others get condemnation and unending death. On the other hand, if death is the state of being separated from God, that separation may be eliminated through the individual's will as he chooses to believe God's unique provision that provision is God's word. God says in his word, so then faith cometh by what? It's up there. Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. It's up to the individual. He has to choose to accept that payment and salvation that Jesus Christ offered. He chooses to accept it. In tomorrow's... Uh, Saturday session, we're going to talk about the tumbling you, that's unconditional election, and show that that doesn't work. There is no such thing as unconditional election for salvation. There is something else. That word is in the Bible. Come and you'll find out what election really means. Probably you may never have heard what it truly means based on the scriptures. Now, God's word is the key. If you don't share God's word when you share the gospel, don't bother. Because your words mean nothing. The power is in the scriptures. It's not magic. It's truth. And as you share the word, the Holy Spirit confirms in the heart of that person that what they're hearing is the truth. And that they are a sinner. And that apart from by faith trusting in Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. That's your job. Oh, you can explain it. Uh, you know, if I use the authorized version, some of those words are a little hard. You explain that. But you use his word. And that's what's not being done anymore. People talk about, is Jesus in your life? Eh. So is the President of the United States, cause, or used to, cause me all kinds of problems. It's in my life, but I don't know him. Oh, I hear Christian music, you know, and I, I, this and that. I go with Christians to the restaurants. He's in my life. Eh, it doesn't mean anything. Is he in you? Have you received him as your savior? If you haven't, he's not really. You aren't in Christ and he's not in you. It's interesting because remember when Adam was made alive, it says God, what? Breathed the breath of life into Adam. He became a living soul. 
God inspired, we're reading in 2 Timothy 3.15, that literally means God breathed his word into the scriptures. Same thing that gave Adam life. Give spiritual life to those who are spiritually dead and willing to hear and believe the word. Certainly I wouldn't question whether a stone can hear or not. But a spiritually dead human being is not a stone. He is separated from God. And yes, biblically, he's spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4 Verse 3 says, if our gospel be hid or veiled, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, not the true God, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Do you know a Calvinist believes that the God of this world blinds the minds who those are elected to hell? We'll see that in my next session. John reminds us in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was what? The Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Verse 12 is, of course, the verse I've already told you. After he says, the Word is life, he says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You can have two choices of the definition of death. But remember, which definition you choose basically determines eternity for people you may love. One must choose this definition according to the scriptures. Okay, little chart. I'm an engineer, been an engineer for many years, been in ministry for many years. I'm an old guy. I like charts. So here's a chart. I was going to draw little circles with you, but, well, I couldn't get my thing to work. Two definitions of human depravity. Man, Pastor, you must have long eyesight or something. (laughs) Picture used of spiritual death in Calvinism is a stone or a corpse. The result of spiritual death is total inability to respond in any way. The individual's spiritual response is impossible. God must do a thing called regeneration first. Calvinists define regeneration as occurring either at your conception, at your physical birth, or perhaps some magical point in your early life when God said you were elected, so I've regenerated you. See, it's nothing you do at all. You either are or you ain't. Regeneration. That comes before any action, will, choice, faith, belief that you might have. You see, when I was led to the Lord, I was led to the Lord by a Calvinist. He believed God commanded him to share the gospel In his head, he said, if you respond, you're elect. If you don't, you're not. But all his job was was to share that. But he happened to spend five days teaching the scriptures. At the end of the fifth day, I became convicted I was a sinner. I became convicted that I couldn't save myself. I became convicted that I needed to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I accepted him in my life. Into my heart. There I did it, see? Into my heart. But they say, no, 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 no. You were probably regenerated when you were created. And it just waited till you acknowledged Christ. No, 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 no. Like the song, I knew it, what happened that day. That's a Calvinist view. Here's a Biblicist view. Picture used of spiritual death. Spiritually blind. Okay? Result of spiritual death. Separated from God, but you can hear. Faith cometh by hearing. Individual spiritual response. It's possible through God's word and the spirit confirming it in you. Regeneration. That occurs the instant after you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And here's what you do. If you have 
If some of you are visitors, you have a pastor, you're not sure where they stand. Or you have family members who you're not sure where they stand, but they're starting to talk about this Calvinism thing. Because as I was told by one Christian worker, it's rushing through like a wildfire in this country. That's this country is the U.S. It is. I get an average of two calls a week about it, churches that are being divided and destroyed over it. And I've got people in Vietnam last week contacted me. We have people in Germany and Hungary contacting me. It's being pushed. In fact, it's so aggressive, you'd think it's more important than whether people are saved is whether they're a Calvinist or not. And I've challenged some of them to say that because that's what it is. Okay, here's what you do. You don't have to have this fancy chart. You can make it even simpler. I've made it actually simpler than I would have normally made. The Calvinism side. All you have to do, there's the route of life from a Calvinistic viewpoint. You have a physical birth and you are regenerated. They argue among themselves when you're regenerated. So don't argue that. There's no point in it. Whether it's at conception, whether it's at birth, whether it's at your, your infant baptism, whatever. They say regeneration occurs and at some other point in life. And they'll occasionally use the word faith. I used it there for the comparison. You'll acknowledge that he really is real. You know what I'm afraid of? There's a whole lot of people out there that have heard this and acknowledged an interest in Jesus Christ and have an intellectual knowledge of Jesus Christ and they're going to go to hell. And they'll say, Lord, Lord. I was in a class with 18 other pre-high schoolers. We were to be confirmed that we were the elect. And we studied the doctrines. And at the end of about eight weeks, the minister says to us, remember now we're about to go into high school, there's a thing called peer pressure. Eighteen of us around a table, he says, how many of you believe the Apostles' Creed, which is the doctrine that was taught? And you know what you do when you're going into high school? Sure, because everybody else's hand went up. Of those 18 people, to this date, I have confirmed myself and one other came to know Jesus Christ later as their Savior, by faith alone. I have seen no evidence, and surprisingly, I've been able to relatively keep in touch with some of them. But they would all say to you, they raise their hand, they acknowledge it, they're the elect. That's sad. But it's more than sad. It's an eternal destiny. So by faith, Biblicism says, faith comes before regeneration. So all you have to say to somebody is write on a piece of paper. We did this in a church. And the people couldn't believe what their pastor did. He was to choose between one or the other. Regeneration before faith, faith before regeneration. And he looked around them all and he said, well, regeneration came before faith. I said, ho, ho, ho. It's not what you said when you candidated at our church. Well, you wouldn't have voted for me if I had said it then. Oh. You see, they didn't argue election. They didn't argue depravity. They said, which comes first? You're a Calvinist or you're a Biblicist? it's going to affect how you share the gospel. Millennials love Calvinism. And by the way, I have to admit, there's times I kind of like the idea because then you don't have to share the gospel and be afraid you'll be rejected because they're either saved or they're not. That's why evangelism and missions are dying today in this country because churches are becoming Calvinistic. Okay, here's my definition. Human depravity is the state of fallen man in a totally unrighteous condition, a fallen and corrupt nature and heart. In this state, he is totally unable to save himself, period. That's it. Nothing about will. We're talking depravity here. Nothing about election. We'll talk about that in my next session. No. He can't, on his own, do anything to save himself. But he can hear the word, 
He can be convicted of the Holy Spirit and then by what? Faith. Receive Jesus Christ and have an eternity forever united to God. You see, the Bible talks about a second death. Those are people who through eternity will never be reunited to God or reconciled to him. That's real, folks. That's sad. I believe the illustration of stone for death and the whole interpretation of dead as a stone and you can't respond in any way is 180 degrees wrong from the scriptures. Therefore, if total depravity has tumbled, you know what? Calvinism is going to have a hard time standing up. Because you'll see in my next session that election, as they define it, is based totally as a result of total human depravity. When those two tumble, wow, it's just a matter of time the next three do. Remember I said that the pseudo-theology, in my case, it didn't fit what they offered me? No, I ruled out Calvinism. By the way, I ruled out Arminianism too because I believe that once you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, he will keep you eternally. Therefore, I said, what kind of suit can I get? Ah. <laughs> Pastor Dwight is the new name. We call it Dwightism. No. I call it Biblicism for lack of a name. And you know what? I found my size. Notice the fit. Notice the physique. Ah. Yeah, amen. Thank you. Jesus, uh, Jesus, Peter wrote, and with this I'm going to close my last verse. Peter wrote, being born again. You know, that's the word regeneration in the Greek. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by election. No, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I hope you found the right suit. I hope you check to be sure that suit still fits. My wife was telling me some suits were getting a little tight. And she finally convinced me. And you know what? Now you're going to see a little pride. I weigh five pounds more than I did in high school. And they fit. I hope it fits for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these good people, Lord. I pray that I've made this simple enough, I've made it clear enough, that it really boils down to what is death. And that in doing that, each of us could decide for ourselves what does the Bible teach. Yes, Lord, I'm thankful that some Calvinist quoted the scriptures to me for five days and I received Christ as my Savior. But Lord, more importantly, and what I'm watching today in churches is a total ending of evangelism, a total ending of missions, because people are either elect or they aren't. They're a stone unless you regenerated them. Father, this upsets me. It concerns me because what kind of love can God have that would be in a world like that? Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for sending your son into this world to die on a cross, to be buried and to be resurrected again to show that he has conquered death, that he has paid for my sins, and that I can have eternity with God and with Jesus Christ. I thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that everybody in this room might know that assurance. But Father, even among the disciples that walked with Jesus Christ, there was one that heard everything that was said, witnessed everything that was done, and did not know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. So Lord, in a room of this size, there's certainly somebody, or maybe others, that don't know you as their Savior. I just pray the Holy Spirit will give them no peace tonight as they put their head on the pillow. 
They'll, they'll think about the words of the scriptures that they've heard. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that they might receive you as their Savior, Lord. If any have questions, let them see Pastor. Let them see me. We can show from the scriptures how they can know you as their Savior and Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Robert, you're being simple enough and clear enough. Amen? Um, in closing tonight, you know, before the Lord took Pastor Chuck home, I know that this was one of the issues that he was concerned about in the Calvary Chapel movement, that this would trickle in little by little. And um, I thank the Lord that there's, there's been, like Robert, that um, really has dedicated his life to bring it to a place where it can be simply understood. To me, as I think it through, it's just common sense. Uh, just being a human, realizing somebody t is going to tell me that I, I don't have free will to exercise my will one way or the other, it, it makes no sense at all. And um, to have, I, I find when I'm talk, talking with a Calvinist, it usually turns into a debate or an argument. And I never can really have fellowship with a Calvinist. <laughs> it never gets to that level. It's always an intellectual debate that, um, that we're, we're headed into. Anyway, I think it's been a pretty good first day. Amen? I mean, the weather... The weather <laughs> i got to apologize to all our southern friends for the 50-degree drop in temperatures that they came from, but... Um, I can promise you it's not going to rain tomorrow or snow, but it's going to be colder than it is today. <laughs> so it's been a good day, and I praise the Lord for it, and I thank the Lord for it, and I go home and get some good rest, and uh, we'll see you bright and early at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, we're trying to keep it in a... I called Joe from Manitowoc. He has a study, and he's supposed to take Chapter 3 in Bastia, has four, but that's not the way we have it in the schedule. So I called Joe after supper, and um, I said, well, we got it set up like this. Can you, can you and Bastia switch it around? So he said, no problem. So the way we're going to have it up tomorrow is we'll be in Chapter 3 with Joe from Manitowoc, and then Bastia has Chapter 4. So uh, let's stand. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for a great day. Um, thank you for... Robert, and Lord, I just pray that you continue to give this man um, strength in body, mind, and spirit in these last days. This is such an important message, and I pray that you continue, as you have been, to open up doors for him. And the battle that rages is a spiritual one, and um, Lord, I pray for those tonight that have been wrestling with this issue, that it has been made simple enough and clear enough for us to grasp what your, what your word clearly teaches on this subject. So we thank you for the day, Lord Jesus, and pray that you give us a good night's nice rest in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys real good. We'll see you at 9 o'clock.